10. The Lying Tongue Scripture has much to say about the lying tongue. Solomon's comment on the matter is especially revealing. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Proverbs 6, 16-19 Of the seven sins here cited, three are directly matters of speech, that is, the lying tongue, the false witness, and he that soweth discord among brethren. As Delich commented, the point made by Solomon is, quote, that no vice is a greater abomination to God than the, in fact, satanical, striving to set men at variance who love one another. End quote. These seven sins are closely related. Quote, the first three characteristics are related to each other as mental, verbal, actual. End quote. The fourth deals with the heart. The fifth, with feet running with haste to evil. The sixth is again verbal, as is the seventh. Quote, the chief of all that God hates is he who takes a fiendish delight in setting at variance men who stand nearly related. End quote. How the Hebrews understood this matter appears in Ben Sirach's comments on the law. Ben Sirach condemned all who relied on dreams and divinations, on false prophecy of any kind. Echoing scripture, he asked, quote, From an unclean thing, what can be clean? And from something false, what can be true? He added that the law must be observed without any such falsehoods, and wisdom finds perfection in truthful lips. Ecclesiasticus 34.8 even more, Ben Sirach declared that a thief is better than a habitual liar, but they are both doomed to destruction. Ecclesiasticus 20:25. 20, this point is of especial importance. A thief takes a man's property, but he does not thereby harm a man's reputation, whereas a liar does damage to a man's reputation and robs him of peace, not only once, but continuously, as the lie circulates and remains. Hence the sharp condemnation of the lying tongue by Solomon and all of Scripture. Both slander and libel are thus very serious offenses. Slander is false witness concerning a man by word of mouth. It is gossip which does injury to a man's character or property, his office or profession. Libel is false witness by means of writing, pictures, or signs. Both libel and slander are forms of false witness. In every age, false witness has been extensive because man is a sinner. But in the modern era, it has particularly been developed into a refined science. Humanistic man, from Machiavelli through Hegel, Marx, and Nietzsche to the present, having no belief in an absolute law, has revived the platonic doctrine of the right of the state to lie. Especially with the birth of the revolutionary era, lying has become a major instrument of civil polity. The vicious slanders and libels of Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, and Napoleon persist in the textbooks to this day. With the two world wars, lying became especially prominent in international politics. At this point, a distinction must be made. Warfare requires strategic deception, but no false witness concerning the character of the enemy is justifiable. Like Rahab, we are not under obligation to tell the truth to someone seeking to kill a godly man, but we are under obligation to bear true witness concerning our enemy. The false witness made with respect to Germany in World War I was thus clearly evil. The stories of German atrocities were manufactured and were vicious and totally false. The false witness born during World War II with respect to Germany is especially notable and revealing. The charge is repeatedly made that six million innocent Jews were slain by the Nazis, and the figure, and even larger figures, is now entrenched in the history books. Ponsin, in summarizing the studies of the French socialist Paul Razignier, himself a prisoner in Buchenwald, states, quote, Razignier reached the conclusion that the number of Jews who died after deportation is approximately 1,200,000, and this figure, he tells us, has finally been accepted as valid by the Centre Mondial de Documentation Vive Contemporain. Likewise, he notes that Paul Hilberg, in his study of the same problem, reached a total of 896,292 victims, end quote. Very many of these people died of epidemics. Many were executed. We will return to this matter again. Meanwhile, let us note that not much has been said of the very extensive mass murders perpetuated by the communists. 
The United States assisted in these by handing over General Vlasov and his army of anti-communist Russians to the communists for execution. The communists executed 12,000 Polish army officers in the Katyn Forest. 400,000 Poles died on their deportation journey. Of 100,000 German prisoners captured at Stalingrad, only 5,000 came back alive. 95,000 died in the prison camps. Four million of the Germans deported by the communists from Silesia died, and so on. The British and the Americans on February 13, 1945, attacked by air Dresden, a hospital city, and killed 130,000 people, almost twice the toll at Hiroshima, without any good military reason. Thus, without going into the Pacific arena of the war, it is clear that all concerned were engaged not only in warfare, but murder as well, with the communists pursuing it as a commonplace policy of state. Let us turn now to another aspect of the same problem. A popular post-war novel described events at Auschwitz during the war and presented its material not only as fact, but actually used the real names of living persons. Thus, a Polish physician who was a prisoner of war in the camp and serving in the camp medical corps was charged with having performed 17,000 quote-unquote experiments on Jewish prisoners in surgery without anesthetics. The doctor immediately sued the novelist for libel. The trial, held in London, quickly reduced the 17,000 cases to 130 contested ones. Sterilization of Jewish women and the castration of men were basic to the quote-unquote experiments. Had the doctor refused, a witness stated, he himself would have been killed. The number of established cases was few. 17,000 was a false figure. The judge, in his summation to the jury, stated that he could give them no, quote, guidance about morals, end quote. The doctor won the case, his award being the smallest coin of the realm, one halfpenny. His share of the legal costs was about 20,000 pounds. The jury agreed that he had been the victim of libel, but it also believed his guilt to be still real enough to merit only a token victory. This trial brings to focus the basic insensitivity to truth which too extensively characterizes this age. The fact that a doctor under any pressure would perform such operations is itself an ugly fact. If only 10 were performed, or even one alone, instead of 130 or 17,000, the crime is real and very serious. Why then the gross exaggeration? Why, too, the malicious misrepresentation of men who were opposed to allied policy, such men as Laval and Quisling, in their own way, quote-unquote, patriots, no better than some of the Allied leaders, worse than some, and perhaps better than most. Let us examine again the mass murders of World War II and the background of false witness during World War I and later. Life had become so cheap and meaningless to these heads of state and their camp followers that a murder or two meant nothing. Likewise, a generation schooled to violence in motion pictures, radio, literature, and press could not be expected to react to a murder or two. The result was a desperately twisted mentality which could only appreciate evil as evil on a massive scale. Did the Nazis actually execute many thousands, tens, or hundred thousands of Jews? Men to whom such murders were nothing had to blow up the figure to millions. Did the doctor perform a number of experiments on living men and women? A few sterilized women and a few castrated men and their horrified tears and grief are not enough to stir the sick and jaded tastes of modern man. Make him guilty of performing 17,000 such operations. The evils were all too real. Even greater is the evil of bearing false witness concerning them, because that false witness will produce an even more vicious reality in the next upheaval. Men are now, quote-unquote, reconciled to a world where millions are murdered or are said to be murdered. What will be required in the way of action and propaganda next time? During World War II, a brief and popular book gave a hint of the new mentality. Kaufman called in 1941 for the total sterilization of all Germans and the elimination thereby of the German nation. Kaufman was not alone. The novelist Ernest Hemingway called for the mass sterilization of all members of Nazi Party organizations in the preface to his book Men at War. The Harvard anthropologist Ernest A. Hooten called for the quote-unquote wiping out of German leadership and quote the subsequent dispersal throughout the world of the rest of the German people, end quote. In view of this massive insensitivity to murder so that false witnesses resorted to, the exaggeration of evil to make it seem evil, 
Evil itself is growing in order to keep pace with the imagination of men, an evil imagination grounded in a false witness. In World War I, the Turks sought to murder all Armenians. At that time, it horrified the world. Today, some Negroes speak freely of the mass murder of all whites, and some whites long for the death of all Negroes, and the shock of such thinking lessens daily. Basic to all lying tongues is the unwillingness to accept responsibility. Satan is called the father of lies by our Lord, John 8:44, and Adam and Eve, after accepting Satan's principle, immediately lied about their guilt, Genesis 3, 9-13. Where men are evading their responsibility, they are liars. In denying their guilt and their responsibility, they must affirm the guilt and responsibility of their environment, human and otherwise. Thus, to return to Ponsin, the thesis of his study is that the Church of Rome has been victimized by the Jews. The plight of the Church is not the responsibility of the Church. Churchmen from the Pope down are all whitewashed. For Ponsin, the guilt always lies elsewhere, with the Jews or with the Freemasons. Satan did tempt Eve, and other people may tempt us, but in the sight of God, the basic and primary responsibility is always ours. We cannot escape from guilt by blaming others. We then add a lying tongue to our offenses, and we then become progressively insensitive to the reality of evil. Just as a narcotic addict needs a progressively larger dose to maintain his habit, so the liar needs both a more monstrous lie and a more perverse reality in order to maintain his stability in terms of evil. A liar is thus more dangerous than a thief. He destroys far more, and he lets loose greater evils. Ponsin, bitterly anti-Jewish, is ready to report the errors in the accounts of Nazi murders of Jews. He is not ready to be distressed that any were brutally murdered. Ponsin is hostile to lies about the numbers of Jews killed, but is he not repeating the lie of Adam and Eve and blaming the evils of the church on everyone except the church? With Eve, Ponsin says, The serpent gave me, and I did eat. It was therefore not my fault. Ponsin must blame someone other than churchmen who have great powers, because to do so would be to accept the guilt of the church and of its members, including himself. Every false witness is dangerous in that it sets loose a vast chain of consequences which cannot be recalled. It unleashes a taint which spreads and leads finally to action. Solomon was right in the sequence of consequences. First, the thought, then the word, and finally, the act. A final note. False witness has no privileged status. For a person to confide in us a piece of gossip, asking us not to disclose his name, does not mean that we are to respect his wishes. To do so is to become a party to his slander of another person, group, or race. Rather, we must refuse to accord to any lie the status of a privileged communication, and must instead correct and or rebuke the liar, and if need be, expose his tactics.